And uh, you here? Yes, uh, I am. Okay, great. And our talk is uh, regularization and the particles on demand method for the solution of the discrete Boltzmann equation. Um, one second, please. Click the uh, present now. Yes, I, I, I'm trying, sorry. Okay. <laughs> At the bottom of your screen. Great. Yeah, we got it. Uh, yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, so my name is Lisa, and I'm going to tell you about a developed modification of method particles on demand. Uh, the weak point of lattice Boltzmann method is an ability to describe high thermal flows. The particles on demand has been proposed in 2019 in the following article. Um, in this uh, method, in each mesh node, the discrete distribution function are represented as a series around the local gauge. Gauge is determined by velocity and temperature. Uh, the transformation between gauges is performed uh, by moment matching and the streaming is performed from off lattice points and is supplemented with interpolation. The method is a promising step for, towards the future of CFD modeling, but um, mass and momentum conservation is not provided and the 3D simulation is not feasible due to high cost. Um, because of gauge transformation at each node for each quadrature point and because interpolation needed. Also, symbolic expression for an inverse matrix is, di is difficult for other than 9 quadrature point and 25 quadrature point. We propose another method for restoring uh, distribution functions uh, from the moments with the use of Hermite expression. Uh, this method is similar to regularized lattice Boltzmann methods, where high moments are cut off. As in the regularized lattice Boltzmann method, it generally requires less data and calculations. The step of moment con conversion from one reference frame to another is added. For some choice of parameters, the method does not differ from the original particles on demand. Um, to overcome the limitations of the lattice Boltzmann method, one can use different reference frames. Uh, velocity and temperature describe the reference frame. Uh, we will call such uh, pair a gauge. So uh, raw moments can be calculated using uh, gauss Hermite quadrature, not only for standard reference frame, or, as in the first equation, but also for the moving reference frame, as in second equation. This uh, value in brackets um, we'll call discrete distribution functions co converted in gauge lambda. From the first two equations, one can obtain an equation in matrix form. Uh, so discrete distribution functions in a new gauge can be calculated multiplying both sides of equation by the inverse matrix. In the particles on demand method, there are two phases in each time step, streaming and collision. Um, let's look at streaming step in more detail. For each time step uh, T, for each mesh point XG, uh, for each uh, distribution function, we st the stream distribution function from the point uh, corresponding to velocity EI. Um, velocity and temperature for the gauge are taken from the uh, next uh, time layer. Uh, this, this is off mesh point, so discrete distribution function in this point is interpolated using, uh, for example, Lagrange interpolation. L is the size of interpolation template. 
As many other Semilagrangian methods, it is not uh, con conservative even in mass. Please refer to the following uh, paper to find out, um, uh, to, to find uh, the bond uh, variant which is explicit and satisfies mass and momentum uh, conservation. In case of fixed interpolation template, particles in demand is conservative for mass and momentum. For interpolation, we have to convert uh, discrete distribution functions from uh, one gauge to a new gauge lambda bar for all template points. So we need to convert and multiply matrices a number of times, which uh, causes a number of problems. So we developed an alternative method for gauge transformation in particles on demand. Um, to reconstruct uh, the distribution, uh, discrete distribution functions from the known moments, instead of using the inverse matrix, distribution functions can be approximated using Hermit expression expansion. Uh, we'll take um, um, uh, polynomials up to order n. So coefficients in the approximation are Hermite moments. Uh, integral can be calculated using gauss met quadrature. So moments A are expressed through discrete distribution function and distri discrete distribution functions are expressed through moments A. Sequentially computating them through each other will lead to regularization. The same process can be made for a moving reference frame lambda. Hermite moments in the standard uh, gauge will be called A and the, in the uh, moving gauge, uh, lambda will, will be called D. If we uh, know values D, then we can calculate discrete distribution functions in the lambda gauge. And if we know how to express moments D from moments A, then we can convert uh, discrete distribution functions from one gauge yeah, one gauge to another using Hermite uh, expansion. To express moments D from moments A, we decompose Hermite polynomials dependent on velocity in moving frame by Hermite polynomials dependent on velocity in standard frame. Integrating the equations, uh, we get the needed expansions, uh, uh, the needed expression for D from A. Uh, so we have the following algorithm of calculations. All data is stored in moments A in the standard gauge. For each mesh point at each time step, uh, s uh, streaming starts with the predictor of a new a prediction of a new gauge as a gauge from the previous time step. Using the gauge, we calculate uh, the point from which we stream. Uh, then, uh, at this point, we interpolate moments A. Uh, then, with the help of the moments A, we calculate uh, moments in moving frame D. Uh, from D, we calculate discrete distribution function using Hermite ex expansion and stream it into point e X. After streaming in this point all needed distribution functions, we can calculate new values of speed and temperature and correct our predictor gauge. Uh, iterations proceed till we find the right values of speed and temperature at, at this point. Once iterations stop, we can calculate collision and the new values of moments in standard frame A. Uh, we call this method regularized particles on demand or rec pond. The particles on demand and regularized particles on demand methods were implemented as the program for GPU. On the slide, one can see calculations results for this program. To compare particles on demand and regularized particles on demand, we studied kinematic viscosity for decaying shear wave at the thermal conditions. Uh, on the graph, you can see the dependence of viscosity on Mach number obtained using different methods. You can see the limitations of lattice Boltzmann method and the uh, results of regularized particles on demand method match the results of 
uh, classical particles in demand method. Uh, the uh, D2Q7 regularized particles in demand uh, has the smallest number of quadrature velocities with which this problem can be modeled. For example, D2Q6 uh, is not enough. Um, same problem in three dimensions uh, shown on slide. As in case of two dimensions, you can see the limitations of lattice Boltzmann method and uh, results of regularized particles on demand method uh, match the results of particles on demand method. And uh, D3 Q13 uh, uh, regularized particles on demand uh, ha method has the smallest number of quadrature velocities with which this problem can be modeled. Mm, regularized particles on demand uh, has uh, less computational complexity with respect to the particles on demand. Several parameters affect the computational complexity. D is the number of dimensions, L is the stencil size, N is the order of Armite expansion, Q is the number of quadrature points, and M is the number of non-repeated mo moments. Uh, it depends on uh, number of Armite expan uh, it depends on Armite expansion order and the number of dimensions. Um, so we can express number of operations for particles on demand and for regularized particles on demand. Uh, these terms make the biggest impact. So, for example, from previous slide, uh, regularized particles on demand have 10 times less operations than particles on demand. Uh, for, so, in conclusion, I want to summarize the main points of this work. We developed the regularized particles on demand method as an alternative uh, method for gauge transformation in particles on demand. Particles on demand and regularized particles on demand are the same scheme if number of non-repeated moments is equal to a number of quadrature points. Regularized particles on demand doesn't uh, conserve mass and momentum like most other Similar Grandian, uh, similar Grandian, uh, Boltzmann method, and uh, we made a code for testing all particles on demand schemes. A regularized particles on demand is validated to be rigorous and efficient. Uh, D2Q6 regularized particles on demand seems to be the minimal scheme for the thermal two-dimensional problems with high math, and uh, D3Q. 13 regularized uh, particles in demand seems to be the minimal scheme for high mech the thermal flows in 3D. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And any uh, questions? Yeah, actually, I have a question. So on, on uh, this slide, you said that there's no mass and uh, momentum conservation. So is that cause problems, in your opinion? Um, I haven't heard the second part of the question. Can you repeat no, it? I'm, I'm just uh, curious. If there's no uh, mass and the momentum conservation, uh, are you going to have problems in your uh, accuracy? Um, yes, and sometimes it can be critical, uh, and there uh, is um, some ways to, uh, there are uh, several, uh, uh, if um, interpolation uh, stencil is fixed, then there is conservation in mass and momentum, but it li limits um, options for, uh, it limits um, um, uh, speed and temperature. Um, less uh, than uh, it, it uh, still can be bigger than in lattice Boltzmann method, but uh, nevertheless, it, it, it's not good. Uh, or one can um, uh, control uh, um, 
this error uh, using smaller um, smaller time step. So. Okay. Yeah, I think there are a couple of questions from the audience. Chris. Oh, you have to unmute your uh, microphone. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, in fact, I have a couple of questions, but I don't know if we will have enough time. So just uh, yeah, to... Well. Co yeah, OK. So regarding the collision model, so here you use the regularized one, but you could use another one, in fact. Does it have an impact on the stability? Because basically, the the POM formulation is an MRT formulation of some model that was published 20 years ago. But since they are only using one relaxation time, it's basically an SRT, so it should have an impact on the stability. What about your code? Did you try to compare the stability of both approaches? Um, I think uh, it, uh, we, um, we research this question uh, right now uh, for mm -hmm. different problems and um, for um, for most uh, problems, we find that regularized method is most stable. Okay, thank you. And, uh, maybe just another question, if I have time. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, regarding the interpolation, I didn't really understand what you said, because for me, from what I know from numerics, there is no such thing as conservative interpolation, because interpolation is uh, basically an average. So what you could do, for example, is to uh, look at what people are doing in inverse boundary conditions. Just look at the mass that you're losing and try to correct it at a correction step and add the mass that you are missing. You can add it to all your population, in fact. That might be a way to ensure that you are indeed conservative. Um, yes, OK. Um. There are very limited uh, ways to make it uh, use an interpolation, make it mm -hmm. conservative, and uh, it uh, can be used only in very specific um, spe specific cases. Yeah, if your point is on a green node, but if it's not, you cannot. In fact, I think mm -hmm. I. I've, okay. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I think there were not another uh, questions from audience. Yeah, the, there was a question of Benedict. Benedict. Yeah, Benedict. So Can Benedict. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess I have a couple of uh, comments regarding also the conversation. Uh, conservation properties. I mean, um, yes, uh, the, the standard similar or the uh, Lagrangian interpolation that we use for the same Lagrangian is not conservative. That, that, that's correct. But of course, there are many other ways how to make it conservative, right? I mean, there's even even a very naive approach to the same Lagrangian convection in a conservative manner. So uh, no, I mean, um, it's not a priori not conservative. We can enforce that. Of course, this comes at a cost in the sense that we have an influence region that we need to take into account, which needs to have the same number of iterations but in general this is um can be made conservative um and then one other questions i would have for this regularized pond is um have you ever checked then the um the influence of accuracy like if you have a turbulent flow for example how would this affect uh we haven't uh, done it yet um yeah. and we actually find out no, um about conservative part, we haven't uh, researched uh, how to um, how to uh, um, fix it uh, in deep uh, yet. So um, we um, first uh, problem that we had uh, the c calculation complexity. So we deal with this problem firstly. And now we find out that it's not conservative and so on. We sure, sure. will fix it later. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. We can um, have a chat maybe later on as well, if you, if you have time to, to discuss that a bit further. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, may I just add a little bit? So 
thank you very much for this presentation. So, um, just a small comment. I mean, the similar Grangian methods intrinsically not rigorously uh, masked as well in general. So, uh, in any setting, whatever, bond, uh, and that. So, the, the reason being simply, especially here, I mean, what, what happened? So, you want to propagate from some position which you don't know, and everybody, all the velocities, grab mass without paying attention who took what from one point. So, that's that's the reason why, basically, the why then. In practice, however, in practice, this is negligible. So all the simulations we're showing, they are mass conserving in practice. So, so that also depends on how you do the, uh, the uh, interpolation business, of course. And there are ways to rigorously impose that you that everybody control, but then you have to, as Benedict said, you have to uh, control in the same iteration all the points, who took what, and that's the, uh, that's a little bit messy. So uh, we prefer to stay with the simplest realizations, and I think what you propose is quite reasonable to have a look at. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, let's thank the speaker again. And um, we move to the uh, uh, next uh, presentation. Uh, it's by. Uh, uh, oh, can right. you hear me? All right. Yes. And uh, it's the talk is on uh, multi scale semi Lagrangian uh, light disposement. The screen is okay? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon. So my name is uh, Kalikunis Nikolos and I uh, will present today my work focusing on multi-scale semi-Lagrangian lattice Boltzmann method. So in lattice Boltzmann simulations, quasi-particles are propagating with specific speeds that belong to a small set of uh, velocities. The standard lattice with nine velocities in two dimensions can uh, adequately be used to simulate simple incompressible flows. However, for more demanding uh, problems, such as compressible flows, shock waves, or rarefied gases, the standard lattice is not enough. And uh, one way to tackle these problems is to use a high order velocity set with uh, more discrete velocities. In practice, there exist a lot of engineering problems which involve multi-scale flows. And the high order velocity set is in principle required only in a portion of the whole domain. So motivated by this reason, in this work, we present a consistent approach of using different velocity sets in different parts of the domain. This approach can be thought of as an extension of the spatial grid refinement, which occurs in almost every realistic CFD problem, adding a refinement in the velocity space. The underlying model is the two population model, which is fully compressible and with variable Prandtl number and adiabatic exponent. Parameters beta 1 and beta 2 are related to the viscosity and the conductivity. And the conserved fields, the density, velocity, and energy can be computed from the moments of F and G populations. To perform the streaming step, we use the semi Lagrangian streaming, in which we follow the advected node back to its uh, departure point, and the population is given by interpolation of the neighboring nodes. In contrast to the conventional lattice Boltzmann, where the spatial lattice is connected to the velocity set, the semi-Lagrangian scheme decouples the velocity space from the spatial grid. And this provides flexibility, which we exploit to deploy different velocity sets throughout the domain. The construction of the particle velocities is based on the assumption that they are given with respect to a global reference frame at rest. Some demand method, however, abandons these uh, constraints and each point in space uses its own reference frame characterized by the flow velocity and the temperature and the discrete velocities are scaled and translated accordingly. The populations in different reference frames can be related based on the fact that the populations are equivalent to moments and that the moments should be independent of the reference frame. 
The numerical implementation of the streaming step starts with an initial predictor reference frame, which is given by the flow velocity and temperature of the previous time step. And the semi-Lagrangian streaming step is performed at this reference frame. The new density, velocity, and the temperature that are computed serve as the corrector reference frame, and this loop iterates until convergence. By construction, this reference frame is the co-moving reference frame, and the equilibrium distribution function becomes exact. So with this idea, the particles on demand method becomes a fully Galilean invariant uh, scene. In uh, this work, the main problem of coupling different velocity sets is to express a low order population vector as a high order one, which uh, we call lifting. And the reverse problem of expressing a high order population vector as a low order, which we call projection. In step, starts with a given low-order population vector, and then the vector of moments is computed. We fill the missing moments that match the high-order velocity set through non-equilibrium extrapolation, which means that we split the missing moments into equilibrium and non-equilibrium parts, where the equilibrium is known, and the non-equilibrium is extrapolated from neighboring nodes that uh, use the high-order velocity set. So finally, the vector of moments is inverted, and we end up at the high order population vector. Perform the projection transformation, we start with a given high order population vector and construct the moments. From this, we keep the first moments that match the dimensions of the low order velocity set, and then we transform back to the population. Based on the lifting and projection transformations, the multi scale framework works with a modification in the streaming step. If the departure point during semi-Lagrangian advection lands between nodes in the interface region, then the either lifting or projection transformation is performed at the nodes that use a different velocity set from the advected node. So for example, in this picture, the top right node, which uses a high order velocity set, is advected and the departure point is uh, located at uh, the point indicated at the picture. Then the nodes A and B that use the low order velocity set perform the lifting transformation. And after this, the population is interpolated as in the semi-Lagrangian semi -Lagrangian streaming step. Framework can operate adaptively based on a refinement criterion. And according to the application, this can be a threshold on the Mach number or a threshold on the local Knudsen number. The local Knudsen number can be computed as a ratio of two length scales, the mean free path and the reference length scale, which is evaluated by the variation of a macroscopic field such as uh, density or speed. The velocity set in the domain is updated according to a predefined frequency, and the change velocity sets perform the projection or lifting transformation to readjust their populations. Now we will move to the simulations of the multi-scale framework. The first uh, two simulations will be using a fixed reference frame where the low order velocity set suffers from errors when the Mach number grows. So the idea is to use the high order velocity set in the high Mach regions. Then the framework will operate using a co-moving reference frame, the PON method, with a focus on non-equilibrium flows. For this case, the idea is, is to use the high order velocity set based on the Knudsen number or close to the wall boundaries. First simulation based on the fixed reference frame is the case of a non-thermal convected vortex. We are using the D2Q9 velocity set at the low Mach regions and the D2Q25 in the high Mach regions. The refinement criterion is a threshold on the Mach number equal to 0.25. The vortex is uh, characterized by an advection Mach number of 0.2 and the vortex Mach number of 0.6. The bottom left figure shows density contours of the advected vortex for the cases of a globally used D2Q9, D2Q25, and the multi scale case. The insufficient uh, isotropy of the D2Q9 results in a distortion of the vortex, which is not observed for the case of the high order and the multi-scale case. The right-hand figure plots the density profile across the cut line as uh, shown in yellow. The black solid line represents the D2Q25 simulation, 
the red squares, the D2Q9, and the blue circles, the multi-case, the multi-scale case. So for the multi-scale simulation, the gray vertical lines indicate the interface of the different velocity sets. And we can see that the multi-scale case and the high order agree very well, while the low order shows uh, deviations. The second simulation with a similar setup for the multi-scale framework consists of, the, of a jet flow in which a high-speed jet at the center of the inlet has a Mach number of 0.6 and the low Mach number of 0.15 is imposed on the sides. The refinement criterion is a threshold for the Mach number again, equal to 0.3, and fixed velocity and zero gradient pressure boundary conditions are imposed on the inlet and fixed pressure and zero gradient velocity at the outlet. The top animation shows with red the regions of D2Q25 velocity set and with blue the D2Q9, while the bottom animation shows the X velocity field. The velocity set in the domain is adaptively updated according to the magnitude of the local Mach number. The time average of the X velocity field for the multi-scale simulation is shown on the left plot. The comparison between the D2Q9 25 and the multi-scale case is shown on the right-hand plots where the, where the velocity profiles are compared along two different cut planes. The blue lines on the plots corresponds to the 25 uh, case, the red to the D2Q9 and the squares to the multi-scale the multi-scale behavior shows good agreement with the D2Q25 simulation, with uh, small deviations occurring at larger distances from the inlet, while the D2Q9 simulation has significant uh, differences in the, in the results. Now we switch to the to simulations where we are using the co-moving reference frame with the POND method. And uh, the first setup is a planar quad flow with finite Knudsen number such that non-equilibrium effects on the flow become important. The setup consists of two walls moving in opposite directions with the same speed. The order of the velocity set is important for such flows, and the DTQ9 cannot accurately describe the velocity profile near the walls. So for this region, we are using the D2Q16 lattice near the walls and the D2Q9 in the main flow. Diffusive uh, boundary conditions are used to at the walls. The results for the normalized uh, velocity profiles for Knudsen number equal to 0.2 and 0.5 are shown in the figures. The red uh, dotted lines in, are the solution from the D2Q9 simulation. The blue squares are from the multi-scale run and the black circles are uh, reference data from linearized BGK. And we notice that as Knudsen number grows, the deviation of the D2Q9 become more important. But for both cases, the, multi, the results from the multi-scale run are in good agreement with the reference data. Finally, we move on the shock structure problem, which is a classical problem in non-equilibrium flows. In uh, this setup, the target is to resolve the fields inside the shock, which vary on a scale of a few mean free paths. For this uh, problem, the POND method is used and the D2Q16 velocity set is used outside the shock and the D2Q25 inside the transition zone. The refinement criterion to use the high order lattice is a threshold of the Knudsen number equal to 0.01. The density, velocity, and the temperature, upstream and downstream, are related according to the ranking Hugonian relations. The results from the multi-scale simulation for the case of Mach number equal to 1.6 are shown in these plots where the normalized density, velocity, stress, tensor, and heat flux uh, profiles are uh, presented. The simulation results correspond to the blue lines uh, on the plots, while the red uh, uh, squares correspond to reference data. The gray lines on the background again indicate the interface of the different velocity sets. And we can see that uh, the multi-scale runs agree very well with the reference data, with some small deviations occurring mainly on the heat flux profile. So summarizing, we have uh, presented the multi-scale framework, which uh, couples different velocity sets, targeting at high speed and the rarefied flows. 
The framework can uh, operate either with a fixed or co-moving uh, reference frame. And based on a refinement criterion, it works in an ad adaptive mode. In addition, it is uh, straightforward to extend the applicability to unstructured meshes. The future research will mainly focus on the lifting step, which is uh, crucial for the quality of the coupling, and also 3D applications. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And, uh... Any questions? Okay, go ahead, Christopher. Okay, thank you again for your presentation. Okay, my web is, cam is on now. Could you come back to slide four, I think, four or five? Four, sorry, yep. So here you are saying that uh, there is something I'm not understanding here. If you get rid of the transformation in the moment space, do you agree on the fact that this is the model of Sun that was published 20 years ago? Yes or no? Regarding the fact that discrete velocities depend on temperature and velocity. Yes, this, this uh, has been uh, uh, restated in the past, but the formulation here is uh, so two years but ago. If, if, yeah, but if you implement it, in fact, the only difference is the moment space. So I don't really understand why you are not citing these papers. And it's the same if you talk about the coupling between different lattices. I think it was, it was done by Meng, Zhang, and Shan. I can put the references here. Yes, it's the, the reference In the context of, of rarefied flows. The reference of what you're talking about Ah, sorry, sorry, my bad. Thing. This, this one, you, you are correct. It, it was uh, a similar uh, paper with some differences in the numerical scheme. And, uh, but uh, quite close in spirit. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, may I ma make a comment here? Of course. About that it was done by some, it's not, because the main point here is adaptive search for the uh, local reference frame. So that was not done. Okay, I do agree on that, but you should specify it. You cannot say that the use of discrete velocities that depends on temperature and velocity was introduced in that paper. That's not rigorous. I'm sorry, uh, what were you saying? I was saying that the fact that discrete velocities depends on temperature and velocity, that okay. was not introduced in well, that paper. It depends on temperature and velocity. Everybody knows. Okay. The point is the realization. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Right. Any more uh, questions? Yeah, so I have a question, actually. Uh, so did you uh, test the numerical uh, dissipations in the scheme? If you have uh, you know, adaptive or uh, interpolations, uh, did you observe any uh, additional numerical dissipations? The coupling is, uh, we had some problems. So the strategy how to mainly proceed in the lifting step was uh, explored. And uh, how you exactly reconstruct the high order population from the low order one is quite important. So there, there are uh, some problems in, this, in uh, some cases. However, this, uh, this approach uh, worked uh, quite uh, satisfactorily in uh, most of cases. But uh, of course, there is quite room of improve, improvement for this particular step. OK. Yeah. And also, exactly. with, uh, an idea of uh, overlapping zones uh, or we had some trying, we tried with this approach also, but uh, we're still on, uh, on this phase. Okay. Yeah, I think there were questions from the audience. Could you, you can go ahead. Sorry? I think there were questions from the audience, or uh, let me see. No? Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank the speaker again. And the so, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry for this confusion uh, based on some misunderstanding. But anyway, um, I will take care of the time. Uh, so now, Dominic, nice to see you. <laughs> Again, so Dominic Wilder, 
uh, is going to present a talk, which is a joint work with a number of collaborators uh, about semi Lagrangian lattice Boltzmann method for compressible flow. So I remind that you have 20 minutes in total, counting from <laughs> from uh, seven minutes ago. No, I'm so from. Uh, from uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We cannot hear you, Dominic. No, Dominic, we don't hear you. Okay. okay. Can you see me and hear me right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's let me just let's start now. Yeah, okay. I start and I I get the time again back somehow. Okay, um so Basically, um, what I was saying is uh, that I'm located there where the dot is. Okay, so next slide is the outline is um, the compressible let's Boltzmann that model that we used, and I will quickly quickly um, recapitulate the similar Gaussian streaming step. Although we heard a lot about it today already, and show you the results and the quest for three dimension, which is an in interesting topic as we find. And to compare both um, approaches, the standard lattice Boltzmann method uses a second order equilibrium and the standard stencils that are widely used in combination with the BGK collision model and on lattice streaming. In comparison to that, we have a fourth order equilibrium based on the meat expansion. And in the first approach, we use a D2Q25 W distribution function um, velocity set in order to capture polyatomic flows. Uh, but we rely basically on the BGK collision model and we use off letter streaming. This is why it's called similar Lagrangian method and um, we use an interpolation therefore. Compared to the particles on demand method, which we heard several times during this week right now, um, we are operating in a static reference frame, just doing one step back. This is a very promising approach, the, P, the particles on demand to achieve high Mach number flows, but we want to just examine the properties of the scheme if we remain in the static reference frame, the same that we have in the regular lattice Boltzmann method. And in addition, we use high order stencils, high order equilibria and a high order interpolation, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, again, this is a velocity set um, which is based on the roots of the fifth order Amit polynomial and it recovers the moments up to fourth order. And in, as you might know right now, the off lattice Boltzmann methods allow for special unusual velocity sets. And I will come back to this at the very end of my talk. Just again, the similar Gaussian streaming step is you may operate on an unstructured or structured grid. You fo follow the trajectories of your velocities back, uh, set back in, in time, depending on your time step size and your stencil, of course. Uh, you locate your, your cell where the departure point is located. Then you use interpolation polynomials in this cell to, to, to 
gain the, the distribution function value that you desire. And afterwards, after you got the distribution function value, you stream it to the desired grid points. And as I'm saying, we are using a high order interpolation to have spatially high order and low errors. And if you used uh, equidistant nodes, then you would have Runge oscillations. And in order to, to avoid that, in our work, we used Chebyshev nodes. And this means that the reference cell looks like this, which can be distorted for, um, depending on the, the grid that you use. So what are the results of this approach? Let's do and have a look on the weakly compressible flow first, just to examine the, the, the properties of the scheme. So in the first approach, we used a Taylor Green vortex, which is non-moved. And this is just a regular case that we all know very well, but we simulated it with a fourth order equilibrium, but all the thermal terms in the equilibrium were just dropped to be a-thermal. And we compare to D2Q9 and D2Q25. And then we, in a second scenario, we induced a horizontal velocity into the flow. And what this means, I will show you in a minute. So for the non-moving telogene vortex, we see that uh, the errors decrease as expected for increasing spatial resolution. But you also see that the interpolation introduces additional errors, uh, which can be caused to the interpolation. So they, the errors are three times higher for the higher velocity set. Um, but if you're moving the, the Taylor Green vortex, then the errors that you have in the Q9 letters are drastically increasing, which are simply caused to the non-existent Galilean invariance. And all these errors you can uh, you are just cancelled if you use a high order velocity set in combination with a high order equilibrium. And I mean these properties are well known, but we could just we could again show them with this simple test case at a quite low uh, velocity in the horizontal direction. Mm -hmm. But we could also use this test case to examine the maximum speed that we can ob obtain with this with this uh, velocity set. And we see that it is time dependent. So it depends on the, the time step size that you use. And so the maximum Mach number is about 2.0, it's somewhere between 1.5 and 2.0, depending on the, on the time step size. And there is a local minimum uh, depending on the time step size that you employ, which is somewhere between the maximum and the minimum time step size that we used here. We also used or simulated the shock truck tube and get the results as expected with a regular shock tube uh, with a high or with a, with a regular density ratio that you often find in the literature of eight to one. And also simulated uh, the 2D Riemann problem with a comparable resolution compared to uh, in regular NS solvers, so Navier-Stokes solvers. In addition, we did a short vortex interaction, which is a viscous test case, and we could show that we are able to use stretched, gritches, stretched grit, grits in order to emphasize the shock and to reduce the number of grit cells which are needed for this simulation. So these are basically the, the results we got right now. And now I'm showing you how we think that we can do, do master the quest for three dimensions with this approach. So there is a curse of dimensionality in the, in the quadrature literature. And for the regular stencils that are use, usually used, um, you go to up to 27 velocities for the third order emit polynomials. So if you do the product rule, you get up to 27 velocities. But if you do the same for the fifth order Hermit polynomial, then you will see that we end up with 125 discrete velocities, and this is just not doable and not useful. So the question is whether and if and how we can overcome this curse. 
And I think that we can overcome this curse. And for this, the quadrature degree has to be sufficient. So the quadrature degree is well explained in the in the paper of um, Shan in, in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics of 2006. And it's coupled with the order of integration. And you have to have five or seven for weakly compressible flows. So seven is better to cancel errors or degree nine for fully compressible flows. And the quadrature has to integrate e to the power of minus x squared, which is basically the weight function that we have in lattice Boltzmann. So there is a broad variety of literature that you can find about uh, quadrature or cubature, with how it is called in the literature, if you have multivariate integration. And so there is a, a list of integrals with abscisse and weights that you can use. And there are also software packages where, uh, where the cubature is well listed and you can use immediately. So, and we did this and replaced the DTQ25, which we used in, in the paper with uh, DTQ19, which has the same degree of precision. And um, as you can see, it's not, it's quite subtle. It's not um, that you would be able to find it um, yeah, just by imagination, but you have to, I think you have to try it and it's still an active field of, of research. But we were able to use this velocity set in the shock vortex interaction. And by this, we could reduce the number of, or the computational costs by, by per 20%. Additionally, and this is not that much a secret, you can also use platonic solids for the, for the quadrature. So we saw in the last uh, talk the uh, 13 velocity quadrature, which, which has a quadrature degree of five, which was also present, presented in other in literature of the past, but also in the, in the um, encyclopedia by Stroud in the, uh, of the year 1971. So it's not a lettuce Boltzmann invention. It was uh, yeah, stated much earlier. And the same applies to the D3Q21, which is based on a dodecahedron. And you can also find it in the same, in the same book. Yeah, we tested this in the first uh, trial with a telogen vortex, just in the, also in the weakly compressible regime. So it's not... Uh, Oh, it's not already a compressible test case, but I don't want to overwhelm you with all the lines, but trust me, basically the, uh, the, what we think is that we can use all these presented velocity sets in our simulations. And it seems as if there all, would be a small advantage for the, uh, for the platonic based velocity sets, which you can see in the scaled anstrophy, which is here and that you resolve more scales, which has to do with the number of interpolations that you use in the, in the simulation, I think. Um, so it's an under-resolved simulation, which is why we don't match exactly the reference solution. But still, I think we, sh we see that we can use these velocity sets. And we did the same in finding a quadrature degree of precision of nine. And this is, audio, although you can hardly see it, it's a pruned D3Q125. So you just left out some of the abscisse, and this is what you get. And yeah, it's still too large from my, from my point of view, but we used it at least to test whether it works at all. And we see that you can use it, but the 21 velocity set in this case is uh, superior again, because of the uh, reduced amount of interpolation that you need. So what comes next? And we have to test the, the, the velocity sets in three dimensions for compressible flows. And we have to further reduce the number of abscisse. And there is a paper of 1977 where they state a quarter to nine De quadrature of degree nine with 45 abscisse, which is already quite nice. And the theory that you can find in Stroud's book says that you can go up to 30, 
five. I've still say I think it is hard to to get to this point, but it's still an active field in the cubature literature, and the question remains if we can find even better stencils. So looks good, and I think this concludes my talk. And if you want to read more about the similar Grange lattice Boltzmann methods with the results in the middle of this talk, then you can find it in the in the paper, which is openly accessible in PIE. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Um, yep. Questions? I somehow do not receive any written, anything written. So maybe somebody would like to ask something. So Anastasia Peribyogina ask the question. Hi, uh, excuse me. Thank you for, uh, do you hear me? Yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, on uh, uh, you have presented an illustration of a two-dimensional quadrature, and it seemed anisotropic, like it was stretched more in the vertical axis than in the horizontal axis. Yeah, this is interesting. We found this as well. So I impl implemented also in two different ways because I think that the horizontal velocity that you achieve in one direction could be higher than in the other one. Yeah, and it's not what we expected actually but this it works and so as long as the quadrature degree is fulfilled then the quadrature may look like this like uh, uh well really for 19 velocities the best quadrature uh, appeared to be anisotropic or uh, is yeah. there no uh, like uh, isotropic uh I uh, mean, if you, for... you mean the, the, the equations that we saw earlier today, so that um, the, the isotropic uh, um, equations have to be fulfilled, and they are fulfilled for this velocity set. Yes, I tested it. Mm, okay, thank you. So, any other questions, please? Well, I have a small question. Yeah. So, you were talking about the compressible model. So, what the bundle number gamma? Uh, in your case? So it was 1.4, as I said in the very beginning, and okay, I did not talk about it. Um, I used the double distribution function. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, it's just here. A double distribution function. So okay. we have two sets of uh, distribution functions because this is the best I found for implementing a polyatomic uh, flow in Lattice Boltzmann. Right now. Yeah. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you, Dominic, once again. And we move on to the next presentation by uh, Jose yeah. uh, <laughs> Sadat, Benedict Dorfer, and uh, myself. Okay, so. So can you, can you see the screen? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the topic of uh, my presentation today is uh, compressible that is Boltzmann framework for the simulation of moving boundary problems. So, as you know, uh, Moving boundary problems can be found in uh, many engineering applications and also in natural phenomena. For example, in the internal combustion engines or uh, in nature, in fish swimming or in flapping flights of birds and insects, we see this kind of fluid flows. So it is actually very important for us to be able to accurately simulate moving boundary problems. Now, the main question is, how to simulate moving boundary problems. For doing that, there are actually two main approaches in the literature. In the first approach, we have a fixed Cartesian grid that cuts the boundaries of the immersed moving object. And then the main task is to impose a proper boundary condition on the moving body. So most of the Lattice Boltzmann realizations in the literature use this approach. With this approach, uh, the process of grid generation becomes totally trivial. However, uh, as I said, imposing the boundary condition is not uh, that straightforward. 
Uh, but there is also uh, another approach for doing the moving boundary problems, the approach that uh, we have also used in this study, and that is called the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian, or in short, the ALE method. So the idea of ALE is to map the governing equations from the physical domain, which is moving, to a fixed computational domain, and then solve all the resulting equations in that fixed computational domain. The main advantage of this approach, ALE approach, is that it makes it possible for us to have body conforming grid. And that is important if you have high Reynolds number flows or if uh, resolving the boundary layer with good accuracy is important to us. This method, however, comes with a disadvantage for problems with large deformation. And the reason is that when we have large deformation, regenerate the mesh, and regenerating the mesh is computationally expensive. Now, uh, in order to apply the ALE method to the uh, Lattice-Boltzmann framework, we start with the Boltzmann equation in the physical domain, in the moving physical domain. So here we have uh, CI as our discrete velocities, and omega I is the collision operator. The goal here is to transform or map this equation from the physical domain to computational domain. So for doing that, what we have to do is that we have to rewrite all the derivatives in this new coordinate system using the chain rule. If we do that, we get this equation, which is the Boltzmann equation in the computational domain. As you can see here, the only difference between these two equations is in the discrete velocities here. That means that all the information about uh, the movement of the physical domain uh, goes into this uh, transformed, this new transformed velocity c hat i. So this c hat i has this vg term, which is the mesh velocity, and also this g inverse transpose, where uh, g inverse is the inverse of the Jacobian matrix of the mapping. And in two dimensions, uh, this matrix can be computed using this equation. So now we have uh, our governing equation in the computational domain. And the next step is to discretize this equation. And the discretization is done in a way which is uh, very similar to what we do in, in the standard lattice Boltzmann, that is through propagation and collision steps. The only difference is that, uh, like previous pre presentations, we have to do some form of interpolation in the uh, propagation step. For example, if we do the propagation for this point and we follow the characteristic curve backward in time, the departure point would be a point like this, which is not on lattice necessarily. So at this point, we have to do interpolation to reconstruct the populations at, at the departure point. And the interpolation scheme that we have used is the second order accurate finite element interpolation using nine collocation points, the uh, red circles that you can see in this picture. So after doing the propagation, we do the collision and we compute the post-collision populations as in the standard lattice Boltzmann. So uh, the ALE algorithm that I described so far, that is somehow general. And the final step is to apply this algorithm to a lattice Boltzmann model. Uh, the lattice Boltzmann model that we use in this study is the compressible lattice Boltzmann on the standard lattices, that is D2Q9 in two dimensions or D3Q27 in three dimensions. So this model is actually a two population of, the, of a model that was produced in 2008. In this model, we have two populations. The first population F is for the density and momentum and the second population G is for the total energy. The important part of this method or this model is this correction term phi i in the first population. This is the term which is responsible for canceling out the spurious terms in the momentum equations. Because as you know, with the standard lattices, we always have some deviations in the third order equilibrium moment from the Maxwell Boltzmann moment. This deviation is something like this. And because of this deviation, we always have some spurious terms in the momentum equations. If we do Chapman and Scope analysis, we can find those spurious terms, and then with this uh, forcing term or correction term, we can eliminate them. 
So this was the model that we have used and uh, now we can move on to results. So the first test case that we considered for validation of our solver is the flow over knock airfoil in plunging motion. Uh, so in this test case, the airfoil is moving up and down. The Mach number of the incoming flow is 0.2. The Reynolds number is around 1800. The uh, amplitude of the plunging motion is 8% of the chord and the Strual number is 0.46. Here in the right, you can see the unstructured mesh that we have used for this simulation. And then in the left, you see the vortex pattern in comparison with the experimental result. And uh, so you see that here we have a symmetric vortex pattern, which is very similar to the experiment. Now to quantitatively uh, validate the solver, here we have compared the uh, time evolution of lift and drag coefficients with the numerical results of the spectral difference compressible number stoke solver. Uh, we see a very good agreement. Uh, the lift coefficient oscillates symmetrically around uh, zero, but the, av the net average of the drag coefficient is a small negative number. So that means that in this case, we have a small trust. Now we increase the uh, plunge amplitude to 12% of the chord and the Struhal number to 1.5 with the same uh, Mach number and Reynolds number. And in this case, in this uh, fast plunging case, the symmetric vortex pattern is lost. We have a deflected vortex street, which is again very similar to what is observed in the experiment. And here also, in the right, we see the comparison with the numerical results of Navier Stoics. The only thing that I want to note is that in this case, the drag coefficient is mainly negative. That means that we have larger trust with the fast plunging motion. Now the test, the next test case is the flow over airfoil in pitching motion. Here, the airfoil is pitching around its uh, quarter chord. The pitching amplitude is two degrees and the Reynolds number is uh, 12,000. So again, in the left, you see the uh, vortex pattern in comparison with the experiment at the reduced frequency of 6.68. And here in this picture, I've compared the trust coefficient with the other experimental and numerical results in the literature. Uh, the interesting thing in this picture is that uh, uh, in low Mach number flow, with increasing the reduced frequency, the trust coefficient also increases. And this is also what is observed in the uh, uh, water tunnel experiments. However, if we increase the Mach number to 0.2, then we see a different behavior. And with increasing the reduced frequency, the trust coefficient decreases. And this is also quite consistent with the numerical results of Navier Stokes at the same Mach number. Now, the next test case is a, a bit more complicated in the sense that we have now two bodies which are moving relative to each other. So here the incoming Mach number is 0.1, the Reynolds number is 630, and the Struhl number is 1.5. And in this table, I have compared the uh, trust coefficient of the tail fin, which is displayed at these four positions, again with the numerical results of Navier Stokes. And we can see a, a good match between the results here. And finally, the last test case is the transonic flow over airfoil in pitching motion. But for doing this, uh, high speed test case, we have to do a slight modification in our lattice Boltzmann model, in our compressible model. So the uh, compressible model that I described earlier, the operating range of that model is limited to high subsonic or transonic flows. That means that if we have supersonic flows, then the deviations in the higher order moments become large and that makes the simulation unstable. So in order to uh, increase the operating range of this model, we decided to use the concept of shifted lattice, meaning that we write the discrete velocities in a reference frame, which is moving with a constant velocity u hat. By doing this, the deviations in higher order moments will be minimized whenever the flow velocity is around 
this capital U. And that means that the operating range of this model will also be shifted by this U. With, uh, with the help of shifted lattice, we were able to do a transonic flow of airfoil in pitching motion at the Mach number of 0.85, Reynolds number 10,000, pitching amplitude of two degrees, and reduced frequency of three. And here you can see that in this case, we get a rather complicated flow field. We have weak shock waves here and here, and these weak shock waves interact with the boundary layer and that results in a, a complex vortex pattern. Also here I show the uh, uh, lift and drag, the time evolution of lift and drag coefficients for this case. So uh, to sum up, what we uh, did in this study is that we proposed the compressible lattice Boltzmann framework for the simulation of moving boundary problems. Our framework has three main elements. The first one is the compressible lattice Boltzmann model on a standard lattices with correction terms and also shifted terms. So we think that this model is a good alternative of higher order lattice for the simulation of high subsonic flows, transonic flows, or even moderately supersonic flows. The second element of this framework was the ALE method, which uh, we used for handling the moving boundaries. And the last element was the finite element reconstruction on unstructured mesh during the propagation step. Now, uh, the future extensions of this framework that we are working on right now is first, the fluid solid interaction. If we couple this framework with a solid solver, we can use that for the FSI applications. And of course, we have to apply this framework for the problems involving large deformation and also uh, to uh, complicated three-dimensional problems. And finally, the last thing that uh, I would like to say before finishing my presentation is that uh, this compressible lattice Boltzmann itself, that can also be extended to more complicated flows like multi-component flows. And this is actually the uh, topic of the next talk, which will be presented by my friend, Nilesh Swant. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Hossein. Uh, yes. Uh, so, questions, comments, please. Audience, we have some time. Oh, uh, Christoph, Christoph, yes, it has been two questions. Yeah. Yep, thank you very much for your presentation. I have just a quick question regarding no, the. We're not in the high. We're not in the high. So Sorry. I have a question regarding the generation of the mesh. Is it yes. time consuming as compared to running one iteration of the lattice Boltzmann solver? Uh, so for these 2D problems, no, the generation of mesh is, no, it, it's, it's trivial. I mean, computationally, it's nothing. What do you mean nothing? Did you evaluate the ratio between the, the time that you need to recompute it? And uh, that is Boltzmann simulation. So the only thing that we have to do when we generate the unstructured mesh is that we have to compute the departure point of each node. And that is done only one time at the beginning of the simulation. So in 3D, not, not I mean, yeah, in this moving case, then this departure point moves, but then finding the new departure element is not uh, too much computationally expensive because we just need to compute the intersection of the lines with four edges of any element. So yes, this is uh, the computational overhead of this approach in comparison to- Well, uh, may, I, may I ask for a clarification to the case of what that do you mean uh, by comparison? So this is unstructured mesh. So we have the ratio between the links like thousand. So, and that means you have to be more specific when you say, uh, ask the question about the lattice Boltzmann grid, 
which would have for sure quite a few more nodes if you want the same resolution. Yeah, for so sure. I but if know, I would not know how to compare, frankly speaking. <laughs> Because yes. we're comparing two different things, and uh, how would you quantify it? Yeah, in fact, the main issue is that when you go to more complex uh, geometries, you cannot afford anymore to construct unstructured meshes. For example, if you take a full aircraft without any, any simplification, it would take you uh, weeks to generate the mesh, in fact. Well, we're not there yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not sure. Um, oh, sure, but thank you very much for your answer. <laughs> no, you had another question. No, no I think uh, ah, I'm okay. fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So, somebody ready? Well, thank you very much again. If not, then, uh, yeah, let's move on to the next speaker. So next speaker is, well, actually was announced already by the previous speaker, but I will, as a chairman, say it again. So this is Nilesh Savan, um, who will give a talk on the multi-component mixtures with the lattice board. Nilesh, you we have to, uh, you have to, un No, 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 you you you're silent, you silence your mind. It's still silent. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Oh, is the presentation visible? Yes. If you can switch to the presentation mode in the PPT, that would be great. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, our work on recent work on multi component mixtures with the lattice Boltzmann method. So, the goal of our study was to create a lattice Boltzmann model which was fully coupled and compressible and in which the species interaction is pairwise and it is with Stephen Maxwell diffusion. It is, now, it is, sorry, can you switch to the presentation board in the in PPT? It is in the presentation board. No. It's not full screen. Oh, for me it is full screen. There's something. Is it now in the presentation mode? Not for me. Oh, for me it is okay. I'll do. Okay. Something wrong. Your entire screen. Yeah, now it should be fine. Oh, is it in the presentation board now? No, it's black screen. There is a suggestion what we should do. So I'm presenting my screen and now I click. Okay. Okay. Fine now. Fixed. Yeah. So good evening. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, I'll be talking about a recent work on simulating multi-component mixtures with the lattice Boltzmann method. 
So the aim of our study was to create a lattice Boltzmann model that is fully coupled, compressible, and in which the species interaction is pairwise and the diffusion is with the Stephen Maxwell diffusion. So why, why would one need such a model? So we have to remind ourselves that the Fickian diffusion or fixed diffusion is just a special case of Stephen Maxwell diffusion. So yeah, so it's a special case of Stephen Maxwell diffusion and works really well for binary mixtures or when the mixtures are dilute. But then when you have a mixture that is not binary, when you have a lot of components and then they are in varying proportion, so a lot of other interesting things can happen. So for example, one of that is osmotic diffusion. So that is when a species diffuses so that is when a species diffuses even in the absence of a driving force or in the absence of concentration gradient. So if you look at this phenomena from the point of view of fixed diffusion, it would appear as if the fixed diffusion coefficient is infinity. Or there's another phenomena of reverse diffusion when the diffusion occurs from low concentration to high concentration. So that would be like the fixed diffusivity is negative or sometimes what happens is there is a very high there's a very high gradient of concentration that which means a very high driving force but then there is no diffusion happening so that is what is termed in some papers as diffusion barrier and in terms of fixed diffusion that would mean that the diffusion coefficient is actually zero so what I'm intent to say is that the Stephen Maxwell diffusion is a more generic form, a more general form of diffusion that can capture a lot more interesting phenomena than the fixed diffusion can capture. So another advantage we get, which we gain automatically because of Stephen Maxwell diffusion is mass conservation because the formulation, the Stephen Maxwell diffusion formulation by itself is mass conservative. So unlike in the mass average approach, we do not have to worry about mass losses and then the subsequent steps which are needed for like introducing correction velocity and so on. So our model is also free of passive scalars and it is thermodynamically consistent, which automatically makes it a very good candidate for simulating reactive flows in the future. And as to why diffusion is important, so diffusion is almost omnipresent in nature, but there are some applications which I could think of in which diffusion occurs across some membranes. So one of them is a dialysis and another is this upcoming application of fuel cells. So for example, if you see in the schematic of these fuel cells, we have this uh, gas diffusion layers where, for example, if you look at the cathode, so the oxygen has to go from in one direction and the, and the water vapor has to go in the opposite direction. So this is what they call selective transport. So if you want to capture all this phenomena correctly, I think Stephen Maxwell is a very good candidate. So now that I have motivated the problem enough, I will move on to our formulation. So if we so if we rely on the standard kinetic theory definition and the two population model to, let's say we want to simulate M species. So what would we need? We would need M equations for the mass and momentum and then another set of M equations for the energy. So in total, you would need two M equations, but then the way we have written it, we, we rely on the reduced description in that what we do is we have a single equation for the global mass and the total momentum, another single kinetic equation for the total memory or for total energy, and then we have M equations for the species interaction. So instead of two M equations, we have just two plus M equations. So we reduce it, we save a lot on memory because of this formulation. And if we consider some practical problem like hydrogen air system, then that would have minimum of nine components and then the full description would have would would need one to have 20 lattices but then in our reduced description we have only 11 lattices so yeah this is this is a lot of saving in terms of memory so 
So going on to the kinetic equations. So equation one is the set of M kinetic equations for Stephen Maxwell diffusion. And equation number two is, is, is the equation which is the, which is similar to one that was shown in the previous presentation. So equation two is for momentum and uh, mass. And then that equation represents the total momentum and mass of the system. And equation three is another reduced uh, another reduced equation, and then equation three gives the total energy of the system. So I will I will not show the complete Chapman and Scock and all the formulations and so on. But then what we recover at the end is the set of fully compressible Navier-Stokes equation, which are five, six, and seven, and then we have the equation for masses of species, which is equation four. What is new here is the equation eight, the equation of state, which now has the specific gas constant instead of the universal gas constant. So the specific gas constant is universal gas constant by mean molecular weight, which can be readily calculated from the mass fraction. So also to note now is that the parental number, the adiabatic exponent and the specific heat they are all composition dependent. They are all composition dependent and they yeah, naturally change in the flow. For constitutive relations, so I did not write the obvious ones, but then the important one is that we we recover the Stephen Maxwell constitutive constitutive relation given by 10. So the first part of which is this pairwise species interaction, and the second part is parodiffusion. As for the heat flux, we have the usual Fourier heat flux. And then we have this interdiffusion energy flux, which is which is the heat flux caused by diffusion of the species. So I will now straight away go to our validation cases. So yeah, this is this one of the simplest validation case which we did, and then yeah, it is called in the literature as a lost meat tube. So what is a lost meat tube? So basically, it's a set of two tubes, like you can see here, one on the left, one on the right. You fill one, one side with some composition, you fill the second side with some composition, and then you break the barrier. So diffusion occurs, and then eventually you will reach a steady state where yeah, the composition of all the constituents will be uniform all around. But then what we have done in this setup is on the left-hand side, we have hydrogen, and then on the right-hand side, we have argon. So on, sorry, on the right-hand side, we have methane. And then argon is something which is present both on the left side as well as the right side. And it is present in nearly equal concentrations. So the numbers are weird here, like 0 0.509 and 0.485, which is not important. So they were entered just to match with the experiment. So this could have been 0.5 and 0.5, and that would not that would not affect the result. So the main thing we have to look so there are certain obvious things in this. So hydrogen is on the left, so naturally it wants to go to right. And then methane is on the right, it wants to go to left. But then the question we have to answer is what happens to argon? So this is a small schematic which I tried to make for explanation. So yeah, if we look at the fixed diffusion and if we try to predict from the fixed diffusion equation, we can see that, okay, hydrogen is on left, it goes to right and then methane is on right, so it has to go to left so that they attain equilibrium. But then if we look at the fixed formula, what we feel that argon is already at equilibrium because it is present in equal quantities on, on both the sides. But then that is not what is seen in the experiment. So what is seen in the experiment can be easily explained if we take the help of Stephen Maxwell equation. So. So at the crux, what Stephen Maxwell equations say that the pairwise diffusivities between the species, they play the role of inverse frictional drag. So as we can see here that, that the diffusivity, the pairwise diffusivity between argon and methane is much lower than that of that between argon and hydrogen. So what happens is friction between argon methane pair is much higher than the friction between argon hydrogen pair. So basically, argon likes to go where wherever methane goes, and in this setup, because methane is is going from right to left, argon also gets transported from right to left during the transients. So this is the 
this is the result from our code and we have we have validated it with the linearized theory and then also with the experiments but the experiment is not plotted here so what we can see is whatever i i described in the beginning of the presentation so this solid dotted triangles they represent the concentration of argon with respect to time so the upper segment is the left side the lower segment is the right side so what happens at t equal to zero is argon is already at equilibrium composition but it still starts to undergo diffusion so that is the point which i was talking about and which was called osmotic diffusion then we can see that the, the concentration of argon is higher on the left hand side and it's still increasing on the left hand side so that is what is called reverse diffusion or upwell diffusion and then we reach the diffusion barrier point where there is a very high concentration gradient but then there is flattening of diffusion so it's not getting transported here so after the diffusion barrier what happens is the normal fixed diffusion where yeah the things go from high concentration to low concentration and ultimately it reaches the fix the equilibrium concentration and then there is no surprise with with the other two components of hydrogen and methane. So methane was also going, increasing on the left side. Moving on, so to, to, to check the coupling of our code with, with the hydrodynamics, because now we have diffusion hydrodynamics and energy. So we did this case of uh, diffusion in opposed jets where we just have two jets, they impinge on each other, they create a stagnation line, and then they turn away. So on the left hand side, we had hydrogen, nitrogen and water vapor. And on the right hand side, we had nitrogen and oxygen. So we compare the results of this test case with that of the open source code Cantera. And then we see that we have very good agreement for both the mole fractions as well as the velocity profile at the stagnation at, at the middle line. And then we have also captured good features. For example, you can see here that hydrogen is diffusing against the flow and it's moving towards the inlet from left to right. So we have captured all of that correctly. Moving on to a slightly bigger test case, we also did Kelvin Helmholtz instability with two components where we take 90, 10 uh, composition of water and nitrogen just to make the case a bit difficult. And then the relative Mach number was 0.2 and the Reynolds number was 12,000. So we have a perturbation mode in velocity in the y direction and another perturbation mode is in the z direction. So for this test case, we see that we obtain, uh, so this is the plot of turbulent kinetic energy spectrum and we see that we have a very good slope which is very near to the theoretical minus five by three slope of uh, 3D turbulence. I have a video for you. So on the left hand side, what you will see is the contour, uh, the contour of mole fraction of nitrogen. And on the right hand side, these are interface points or interface surfaces. So what I mean by the interface is that they are the isosurfaces of the equilibrium concentration. So in this case, there will be 0 0.5, 0 0.5 for nitrogen and water. And you can see how this goes. So first the symmetry breaks in the y direction and then this, this starts forming rolls and then after some time the symmetry will also break in the span wise direction. Now you can see it here and then smaller structures are formed. So moving on, so now we have a model that is very ready to do the reactive flows. So all we have to do is add this small source term, which is chemical mass source term to the, to the species equation. The Stephen Maxwell diffusion remains as it is. And what we do is we rewrite the energy to include the total energy. So usually in fluid dynamics, we only have the sensible energy, but now we also include the energy of formation. So what we have to do now is that we get the source term from any other solver like Chemkin or Cantera. And then the, in, in terms of energy, we do not need to add any source term in, into the energy because it's implicit now, now that we have created a very consistent uh, thermodynamic model. So I'll show you one test case, which we did. 
so this is one of the standard test case in which we in which we measure the burning velocity so what we have done is we we we, we consider the full uh, the full model with nine species and 28 28 chemical reactions so we have coupled it with cantera we have all these nine species and then what we do is we pump in air at some temperature and one one atmospheric pressure and we burn it at the outlet and then whatever flame propagates upstream we we measure the speed of that flame so we can see the result on the right hand side where the red dots are where the red dots are our results for lbm with cantera so we have a very good agreement with all other readings from the from the literature so what have we achieved so what we have created now is an lbm model that is efficient in terms of memory it is also free of passive scalars it has stephen maxwell diffusivity it is compressible and thermodynamically consistent and now that we know that it works so our future work will be more focused on how to do reactive flows with this model so yeah so this study was uh, supported by cs the compute time at cscs and then my funding comes out from api Zurich. so thank you for your time I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, uh, thank you, Nilesh, uh, for for the presentation, and we have time for questions. Of course. If there are. So, uh, Ali, Ali Hosseini, please ask the question. I do not hear anything. No, Ali, we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, just a quick question. I think it was the the last slide. I guess it was uh, slide number 13, where you had the, the laminar burning velocity of the hydrogen flame. Yeah. Is my screen sharing on? Uh, yes. Yes. So just the question that I had. So the small differences that you have in the burning velocity at equivalence ratios between 1.5 and 2, is it coming from the chemical scheme that you're using? Because it can come from the chemical scheme. Or is it from the numerical formulation of the solver? So the range you're talking about, uh, what range are we talking about? So the, the inconsistency, I guess, are most pronounced between equivalence ratio, let's say, 125 and... 2.5 yeah so but in that ratio i mean i cannot be sure what is the correct answer because there is already a lot of spread in the data of of, of the experiments and yeah i agree but uh, you can compare for example your burning velocity to a 1d burning velocity that you would get from the for example cantera solver so compared to the cantera solver if you're getting good results it means that maybe the discrepancy is coming from the chemical scheme itself yeah, so I don't have it right here, but then when I compare with Cantera, it is fine between 0.5 and 1, uh, 0.5 and 1. And then as you can see with all our all the other results also, then there are deviations after 1. Mm. So it can be, I guess, explained because most of the chemical schemes that you have, they are valid within a specific area in terms of equivalence ratio, but also the maximum temperature in the domain. Yeah. Yes. That's correct. I mean, that's that's true what you say because, and also most of the models uh, in in Plattis, Boltzmann, or whatever, they would tend to compare for lean frame, like, right? For, for for the lean case, so the equivalence ratio less than one up to one. Only. So most of what we have seen. So here, going into the uh, high uh, equivalence ratio, it, it is correctly says and. You, I think you can agree with that. Uh, it, well, the physics, the physics itself becomes questionable. Then 
to have the right uh, reaction constant and things like that, so which you don't necessarily have. But, yeah. so, but we don't think it is the matter of the soul. And even with Cantera, then we have another thing of which transport model to use in Cantera because there are two of them. There is a mass average model, and then there is the uh, there is the other model, multi model, which which they call multi model. Hmm. Yeah. So then. So, yeah. if I may comment one one thing, so in Cantera, the two models that they have, there is the mixture average in the combustion community. We call it the generalized Fick approximation, and what Cantera calls multi component is not Maxwell Stefan. It's actually the Hirschfelder and Curtis approximation. So if you want to do a true comparison, there are softwares, for example. Eglib is a software that solves the exact Maxwell Stefan system of equation by inverting the matrix system. Can you please spell that for me? Uh, Eglib, uh, I think it's E G G L I B. It has been developed by uh, yeah, Vincent Giovanni. Yeah, so Giovanni is the, is the guy. Yeah, because the the, the multi model inside Cantera that is not very good, so there are a lot of problems with convergence in that model, and then it becomes questionable if. The are useful. Well, that's that's the point, Ari. I want to, to make this point, uh, if I may. <laughs> uh, so there is a, of course. Today we have also seen already some diffusion advection models uh, inevitably. So you also developed yourself uh, quite a powerful uh, models hybrid. So, but uh, it is a a point, uh, and it is difficult to have any discrete velocity or not discrete velocity continuous even model for the right Stefan Maxwell, for the Stefan Maxwell. So we think that this model is probably first, which accomplished that with a decent uh, simplicity and uh, accuracy, I would say. Uh, yeah, so the handling of the Stefan Maxwell here is easier than in even in the conventional setting of the continu continuum equations because we don't need to resolve and invert a very complex uh, matrix uh, which otherwise precludes using uh, most of the time the Stefan Maxwell formulation. That's why people uh, restore uh, to the mixture average and this kind of approximation, but these are approximations for the reason of complexity of implementation of them. So here, because it's full kinetic theory, again, they, uh, that's the uh, sort of <laughs> the point of Lattice Boltzmann, you don't need to invert uh, that uh, degenerated system in the end of the day, you have to invert something but it is much, much simpler. So it's for the getting second order accuracy in the, in the lattice bulk of population. That's and one very quick question, if there is time, it was about uh, second order effects. Have you, uh, have you tried to see how it performs for second order thermal effects like the Dufour effect or the Soré effect? Yeah, so as you can see, my constitutive relation, uh, constitutive relation so Right now, the Stephen Maxwell, uh, the constitutive relation is only up to barrel diffusion. So the Soret effect has not been included yet. Yeah, but that is a good, good, uh, and good, good direction in which I can. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. So, uh, last question. Anybody ready? Well, if not, uh, we close this section today. Let's thank all the speakers who contributed and thank you for the questions. It was interesting. So, and have a nice evening.